Okay, thanks, Ron. Well, it's our great pleasure to introduce our distinguished speakers tonight. Most of you already know that both of these are birding legends, and they've been avid birders since they were about eight years old, and they were birding pals growing up in Southern California. Uh, together, John and Kimball have published several very important works, including The Birds of Southern California, Status and Distribution, The Peterson Field Guide to Warblers, Birds of Southern California, Status and Distribution, and The Birds of the Los Angeles Region. John and Kimball are both active on the board of Western Field Ornithologists. John is the chief consultant and co-author of the National Geographic Birds of North America and a professional bird guide for wings. Kimball is the Ornithology Collection Manager at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, a member of the California Bird Record Committee, co-editor of the Southern California Regional Report for North American Birds, and well, I could go on and on. This is just a partial list of their accomplishments. So without further ado, let's welcome John and Kimball. I guess it's time for me to say hello to everybody. Are we ready to move along? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. So we're gonna to talk tonight about uh, not only white-crowned sparrows, but the complicated web of the different subspecies and the subspecies group and the relationships, how to identify them, uh, whether they come into contact with each other and um, all of those sorts of things. Be sure to write your questions down that we can answer along the way. Uh, the important thing to start off is introducing the players uh, of the white grounds. And here are some things that we will concentrate on. The groups, the number of subspecies, which is five, and the groups of subspecies, which is three. Uh, I always say you get to be a better birder by learning status and distribution. That's probably the most important thing. The first 10 things of being a better birder is learning status and distribution. The vocalizations, uh, we'll play some uh, tapes of the songs and priorities for further research. Uh, also genetics and uh, the DNA, but the ironic thing for a bird that's been so well studied, uh, and Kimball will speak to this later, there are remarkably few studies which reveal their uh, genetic relationships. So that's certainly a priority for the future. We'll go next. I, uh, my background is not in biology, ironically. It's in political science and history. Uh, and I won't be commenting on those subjects very much, except to say that it's always interesting to, with each of our players, I think you learn more about it if you know who described it and from when, the year, maybe the publication, but uh, also the type location reveals very important things. So we'll go next. Here are the three groups. There are five subspecies. So the white crowned sparrow is a polytypic species. So the full name will be a trinomial of three names. We have the tiger group, which is uh, the top two. Basically, we're saying taiga up at the Arctic edge, and then a group on the Pacific coast, and then this more uncertain group in the Western Mountains, uh, Orianta, the ones that nest above me. Those are, our, are the three groups and five players. There's two teams of two, and then one who can't decide what team he's on. Okay, next slide. So here are the breeding ranges of these. And let's take just a minute. We're introducing the players. We have a tundra group, which is Leucophrys and Gambolai. Now we have a cursor. Do you see, most of you know Hudson Bay, uh, that body of water. And the little thumb at the bottom is James Bay. So to the east of that is Leucophrys, and the closely related Gambolai is to the west of Hudson Bay. 
And then right in the, the middle with the cross hatching <coughs> are, um, is sort of a mixture of gambolai and leucopherese and hybrids. So that's the tiger group. This is where they breed. And uh, then you'll see the Pacific group and Pugetensis in the north, the Nuttalai to the south. The Nuttalai is resident, the Pugetensis is migratory. Pugetensis now goes up to southeast Alaska to Ketchikan. And um, they uh, do winter a bit inland as well, at least some into the Central Valley, uh, Walla Walla area. And we'll look at that on the, the winter map. But, um, and then Oriantha, which breeds in the western high mountains, again, on the alpine edge in willow clumps. Um, and they resemble the, well, we'll talk about what they resemble, but it's the one that largely leaves the U.S. in winter. They breed in California, uh, in the, primarily in the Sierra Nevada. Next slide. Here's where they winter. Now remember the tiger group, it goes from Alaska to Labrador. And Luca Freeze to the east of Hudson Bay, it winters mainly in eastern North America, and Gambolai winters very commonly over much of the west. Primarily, not so much on the northern California coast, even on the central California coast, they can be outnumbered by Pugetensis, but a very common bird in southern California. Now, Gambolai, it goes down into Mexico, but you can see Oriantha. Orientas at the bottom there in Mexico, and they barely come into the U.S. in winter. Like down, um, oh, they're around Sierra Vista along the San Pedro River, a few in the Big Bend area, but uh, most go to Mexico, including uh, Baja, California. Next slide. As we look at white crowns, the one is, of course, the vocalizations, and they do sing through the winter, which Kimball will be speaking of. Uh, and they're often in groups, they're gregarious, and sometimes multiple species mix. But if, the first thing to look at is the head. Uh, the black and white stripes on the head uh, are certainly an indicator you're on the right species. And you wanna look to see really how white the white stripes are on the head, or are they slightly, do they have a slightly gray cast? Um, and then you want to look very carefully at the, what we call the lores, everyone black lord or whitish lord, but it's really the supra laurel area. It's above the lores. Um, and see whether it's dark or white. Look carefully at the back pattern and the edges and the centers. The ventral coloration shows subtle differences. The Pacific ones are particularly distinct. Uh, bill color is important. Uh, birds in the immatures through the fall and winter or birds in formative plumage uh, are, are more subtle, but sort of the same sorts of things we discuss in the adults show to one degree or another in the immatures. Okay. Next slide. So we'll start off with the two taiga subspecies. So you'll see here, Forrester, describe the species to science from the mouth of the Severn River in Northwest Ontario in 1772. Forrester, same man of Forrester's turn, described a number of important species, great gray owl. Uh, he described to science Eskimo curlew, which I'm still looking for um, without much success. Um, Forster was a man who attended one of uh, Cook's voyages, James Cook's voyages in the Pacific. I don't know if he was on the same boat with uh, William Bly, who also accompanied one of Cook's voyages. Uh, Bly would go on to have um, movies made about him uh, in Tahiti, various stages of mutiny on the bounty. Uh, Forster was kind of cranky, but he was a good uh, naturalist. Now, for the location, those birds are intergrades. Uh, 
between Gambolai to the west and Pure Leucophries to the east. But for ornithological stability, they've maintained Leucophries for the Hudson Bay birds, keeping in mind that they're mixed. The, um, as I said, they may winter mainly in eastern North America. The other player with pale lores, but very, very similar in many ways to Leucophries, including vocalizations, uh, was named by Nuttle. Um, and the type location is from the winter grounds at uh, Walla Walla, Washington is the type location. And they breed west of Hudson Bay, all the way to the Seward Peninsula, uh, Western Alaska, and breed very, winter very commonly in the West and Northern Mexico. So that's our taiga, our two taiga players. Okay, next slide. So most people, it's, well, I don't know about most, but it's important to understand Leucophrys is the nominant subspecies under the scheme that we've adopted. Uh, the nominant means the second and third name are the same. And it's the first described of the species. So it's Forster's gets the credit Leucophrys. Leucophrys is that eastern white crown type location, Fort Severn, and it's the eastern white crown. So any polytypic species, there will always be one where the second and third name are the same. Red-tailed hawk, Budio jimakensis is a polytypic species. The nominant subspecies is not surprisingly found in Jamaica, as well as a couple of other West Indian islands. Uh, our bird is, so that name would write out Budio jimakensis jimakensis. The bird we see commonly in California Budio jemekensis calurus, the eastern one is borealis, and so on. There can be two subspecies, or in some like horned lark, we're pushing 50 subspecies, or the yellow warbler group. If a species has no described subspecies, like yellow-billed magpie, it's monotypic and you only use the binomial. On we go. So let's start off with our eastern white crown. Um, and uh, this one, an adult photographed Montreal. That's the southwestern part of Quebec, Canada. And, and all, the, all the white crowns there for the most part are uh, leucophries. And pretty striking black and white head stripes. The key thing you want to look at here is that the white, the lower white stripe on the head stops at the eye. And the area in front of that, the supralaural area is black. And the bill is a reddish pink. You can see a little bit of the scapulars. It's a complicated pattern with uh, gray edges to the scapulars, and there's some reddish in there as well as dark, but the edges are the important part, and it's pretty pale below. Next slide. Another shot there, you can see the back pattern a little better, and uh, the supralaural area is mainly black. The white creeps forward a little bit in front of the eye. Maroon and pale gray, dominate the scapulars and the back pattern. And look at the reddish bill again, reddish pink bill. Next slide. Now to the west of Hudson Bay, all the way to Western Alaska, the other taiga breeder is with a very similar back pattern and pretty similar underparts is Gambolai. And notice there that the white supercilium goes through into the supralaural area and uh, is not pinched off there by the lateral crown stripe. Possibly the head stripes aren't quite as white. And the other sure character is, I call the bill a candy corn, what we used to get in trick or treat. I'm told they still give that out to, to give dentists a living for the cavities they fill in. Um, but uh, the bill color is, is subtly different. 
very similar to leukopherese. I, I don't know the genetic studies, but I'm sure they'll show them to be very, very similar to each other. And of course, they integrate widely in the Hudson Bay area. John, if I can interrupt one second, we do have a question that kind of came in uh, for for Forster uh, from Tom Benson. Do the type do the type specimens collected by Forster look like integrates, or do they look like nominate birds? The type specimens have been lost, uh, and so what happened was. They went up back to the type locality, and I can't remember. It's the is topo types, Kimball, the taking a a series from the type location again. I think that's the uh, yeah. It just refers to the type location, right? So they took another series of specimens from there, and they were still an integrated series, which um, and so some, of course, Alan Phillips had to be one because he's always a contrarian. But following Todd, he called Leukafries, he thought maybe the Hudson Bay birds on more of them were similar to Gambolai. So Leukafries would therefore equals Gambolai. And he gave a new name to the birds east of there. Uh, in Quebec, he called those Negrolora. Um, forgetting the PC issues. It was felt by Banks, who wrote the distinctive or the definitive monograph for ornithological st stability. He decided the Hudson Bay birds would be considered leukafries, but the original type specimens are no longer extant. So you're using a topo type series collected at a later date, and I can't remember when that was. Did that answer the question? Uh, ready to go on from this? picture? Yeah, actually it answered both questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so here we have a, a Luca freeze on the right from Montreal and a Campbell eye on the left and the primary features, maybe the only features, uh, are the bill colors and the, and the face pattern. So it all seems pretty straightforward in this particular case, keeping in mind the problem with integrades, which you do see in the East more frequently. And of course, our problem with the bird on the right, if you were to see it out here, you'd think it was Orianta, which was described uh, later, and we'll discuss that at a later point. I think we're ready for the next image. Kimball. Okay, thank you, John. Um, I'm going to turn off my video so you'll have the pleasure of not having to look at me because I think that my sound is going to come across a little bit better out here in the boonies. My bandwidth is leaves something to be desired. So um, if you just can't stand not looking at me, let the chat know and I'll put my video back on. But Right now you're spared having to do that. So we thought we'd talk about the second group, which is another two described subspecies. And this we'd call the Pacific Coastal Group or the Nuttali Group. Um, also sometimes referred to as a yellow-billed group. And I would call that candy corn yellow because I don't know what kind of candy corn John used to get when he was trick-or-treating or maybe still does if he still feels trick-or-treating. But the candy corn I'm familiar with is bright orange, yellow, and white, it's tricolored. And these guys have the yellow part of the candy corn in their bill, whereas I think Gambolai probably has the orange part. But in any case, that's neither here nor there. So um, anyway, uh, Robert Ridgway of, of US National Museum, now Smithsonian Institution fame, um, and of course described in a phenomenal number of taxa in North America. He described uh, Nuttalai in 1899, the type locality being up in Santa Cruz County. And um, we'll talk a little bit about how this group differs in appearance from the other group in a second. But um, this is, a, the Nuttalai is a resident subspecies. So of all five subspecies we're talking about, it's the only one that stays put year round. I don't know what kind of banding data suggests there's some limited movement, but by and large, they're highly sedentary, which is one reason that such, um, 
pronounced song dialects have evolved and developed in uh, much of their range and of course been the uh, famous subject of a lot of studies. But they basically get to uh, Humboldt County, Cape Mendocino, and breed south to Santa Barbara County, western Santa Barbara County, and they've actually occasionally even summer and breed um, in western coastal Santa Barbara County a little bit uh, pushing a little bit south, uh, sometimes around Goleta, that area, but basically Point Conception area. So that's Nuttalai, and that was a distinctive bird, and we'll talk about their distinctions in a second. Uh, Joseph Grinnell, of course, another famous ornithologist most closely associated with the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology in Berkeley, described in 1928 variation within the Pacific group. He noticed that uh, farther north, the birds are diagnosably different and of course, one of the most distinctive things about the subspecies that he named Pugetensis is that that's a migratory subspecies, unlike Nuttalai. So the type locality here was on Vancouver Island up in British Columbia. And essentially, the range of Pugetensis starts at Cape Mendocino, um, uh, where Nuttalai leaves off. And they breed all the way up through coastal British Columbia and have um, in recent years actually expanded their breeding range into southeastern Alaska. But uh, all of these birds are found reason in the, basically the coastal belt. In fact, Nuttalai famously pretty much is restricted to the coastal fog belt and gets pretty scarce as you get inland where the fog ceases to be important. Uh, Pugetensis breeds a bit farther inland. We'll be coming back to that importantly in a, in a little while. But, so Pugetensis is migratory. Um, they depart the northernmost parts of their range in winter and expand to the south, as far north as Southern California, uh, fairly commonly in coastal Los Angeles County. So you can go to places like Malibu, Point Doom, Zuma, other areas along the immediate coast, Palos Verdes even, and see um, Pugetensis in the wintertime. Although even here, they, they tend to be outnumbered by Gambolai in most areas. As you get farther north, in the winter range in central California, they do, as John mentioned earlier, outnumber Gambolai. Um, Fugitensis does get inland somewhat. As John mentioned, they get into the Central Valley in small numbers. Uh, there are a number of records for the Antelope Valley. John's had a record in Nevada. Um, so they can push inland, but uh, essentially don't get anywhere inland from California, uh, normally at least. Uh, how far south they get is still sort of a matter of uh, more study needed, but I think there are actually site records as far as extreme northwestern uh, Baja, California, so they can push that far south in winter. All right, next slide. All right, so looking at this bird, you see two things that might strike you if you just look at the photo. The bill is, is a, sort of a pallid yellowish color, it doesn't have that orange portion of the candy corn. It certainly is nothing you'd call reddish or reddish pink. Um, two other things might strike you. One is that the back striping is quite different from the boreal or the taiga group. Um, essentially it's blackish brown with buffy or pale tannish um, edges uh, if you were to look at individual feathers. And in fact in the article we did in birding in 1995, Jonathan Alderford did a little painting of the, of the typical back feathers and uh, the edge color. So instead of being that dark sort of almost reddish tinge with a whitish or silvery gray border that's more of a really dark blackish brown and a buffy tan coloration on the back. Secondly, they're dingier below. They're not as clean gray as the taiga subspecies. There's a bit of a suffusion of brown or buff, strongest on the sides and the flanks. Um, another thing you might notice in this photo is that there's a bit of a mustachial streak, that little dark streak along the side of the throat there. Uh, that's quite variable. They certainly don't all show it, but they tend to show it more strongly than other subspecies. And I think immature birds, which we'll talk about shortly, uh, tend to have it more pronounced than adults. But it is something more typical of this uh, Pacific Coastal group. The head striping is not nothing like the really uh, bold black and white with flaring white that you see in uh, nominate leucophries and you'll we'll come back to seeing in Oriantha when we talk about the montane birds. Uh, but rather, even though it's black and white striping, 
it's not nearly as contrasty and bold and the white is not nearly so flaringly white as in the other white crowned sparrows. Um, they do in structure differ a little bit from the other groups as you might expect being relatively short distance migrants or not alive being non-migratory their wingtips are a bit shorter so the extension of the primaries beyond the tertials is a little bit shorter than in the other groups that's not something that's going to really strike you in the field um, but these are the basic characters of both of pugetensis but really these apply to both pugetensis and not alive within this uh, Pacific Coast group. Next. Um, so we'll come back to other plumages and uh, immatures a, a little bit later. John, you want to take over again? Yeah, I'm all set. Um, we have a, another subspecies to introduce now that's, I've, by fiat, we have decided to put it in its own group. Uh, it was at one point considered to be with Leucophrys um, and uh, was considered that way up until um, 1932. Now, if it's with Leucophrys, it'd be one of the few subspecies I know where there's a huge break be between that would be two separate breeding populations, one primarily east of Hudson Bay and uh, Quebec, and the other in the high western mountains, uh, wintering primarily in Mexico. Uh, Alberholzer described them as a separate subspecies in 1932 uh, from Idaho, uh, in, not Idaho, um, Oregon, Eastern Oregon, the Warner Mountains, interestingly, which also the Warners extend into Modoc County of California. Um, the banks, went ahead though and merged it back in with Leucophrys. He said he couldn't tell the difference. So there's sort of a, uh, and, and in the BNA series, it's, it's not recognized as a valid subspecies. And yet alone, if you listen to our Orianthus here in uh, at least the Sierra Nevada, they sound totally unlike Leucophrys and it's closely related to uh, Gambolai. They do not winter in um, really in the United States at all. Most go to Mexico. I still remember there was a very flowery article about a lady that was convinced that she, her white crowns that wintered at her feeder in De Denver, she could follow them up the hill to their mountain cabin and they were the same birds. But of course, the ones that are wintered around Denver, they went to Alaska or the Northwest Territory and the one she saw at her cabin breeding had come up from Mexico. Uh, you can, um, the uh, Orianthus, a very late spring migrant relative to Gambola. I remember being at Blythe once on the 1st of May and had 30 white crowns, and every single one of them was Oriantha on its way to the to breed, probably in the Sierra Nevada. So, uh, they migrate south in the fall primarily in September, a little earlier on average than Gambolai. Next slide. So they really are a beautiful white crown, uh, just pure white head stripes and black with a reddish pink bill like Leucophrys and the black, the whole super laurel area is filled in with black. Um, and they maybe more than the other ones, they'll raise their head is a crest slightly, but I'm not sure whether that's a valid difference. Maybe I'm just used to seeing them on the breeding grounds here. But notice how that flaring white head stripe stops barely in front of the eye and then it's solid black. Very different from uh, Gambolai. Back patterns just like Gambolai. It shares that with the taiga. So the taiga and Oriantha those three subspecies have the same back pattern. Next slide. So let's look at a comparison of uh, Gambolai on the right and Oriantha. In addition to the super laurel pattern where the white is pinched off, those head stripes, they really do jump off the head, the contrasting black and pure, pure white or snowy white. The bill colors uh, 
different as well. Dark reddish pink and uh, Orianta and the orangey color and uh, Gambolai. Next slide. Here's um, one from uh, a spring migrant from Big Bend. It shows about where the white is pinched off. It's, and the bill color is often almost a blackish red. In my view, the black's a little more extensive in the super laurel area than uh, leucophries. And something to look at is the way the black sort of slants down towards the bottom of the eye. Leucophry seems to come across a little more horizontal. Now keep in mind the two look very similar and that's the reason those two are, are often synonymized as the same subspecies. Next slide. That's a really nice shot from Herb Clark, the late Herb. It shows the way the black slants down to the bottom of the eye. The white is just really pinched off there, barely in front of the eye. Uh, they do average paler below. It's the palest subspecies below of all the white crowns, paler below than uh, leucophries. Lots of black up on the Coleman. Next slide. So that's a shot of a Oriantha on the left and a Leucophrys on the right. Now the important sort of thing here is Leucophrys is not yet documented from California. And the obvious problem being, well, how would you know for sure that it wasn't an Oriantha? You certainly have to have a specimen. You could, I'm just pointing out, I'm not making any claims, but there's a lot of black on the Coleman on that Oriantha on the left. Next slide. So Kimball will discuss Pugetensis, but we won't dwell on this. In fact, in fact Banks in his uh, very well done uh, monograph on white crowns didn't give a lot of time and attention to the immatures and concentrated on the adults. The, we'll briefly cover the plumages, um, but telling Oriantha from Gambolai is surprisingly very, very easy. Uh, Leucophrys, if anything, telling the immatures between Leucophrys and Oriantha might be easier than the adults. So let's look at some images. That's a classic uh, immature, first fall, formative uh, gambolai. You should know those well at your feeder for most of you. Notice the whole super laurel area is pale. The lateral crown stripes tend to be kind of a rufousy brown, and that's an important character. So the two things really to concentrate on is the color of the lateral crown stripes and the face pattern. Now you can see the back patterns more or less like the adult and Kimball will discuss that when they get to Pugetensis. Next slide. I like this one better uh, in the sense that really shows you the color of the lateral crown stripes and really concentrate on the area in front of the eye, how pale it is. That pale gray color or gray tinge buff that those lateral crown stripes do not come down and they're a rufousy color all the way to the bill. Rufous brown or whatever color you wanna, if you can just sort of try to memorize that head pattern. Next slide. Now here's very similar leucophries. Maybe those lateral crown stripes are a little darker. Maybe they come down a little more into the super laurel area. So again, the supercilium's a little bit pinched off. Uh, the bill color is certainly a little more reddish, perhaps slightly larger, larger bill, but pretty similar. Next slide. Now here is an immature Oriantha. And here the, you can see 
that the lateral crown stripes are a darker, blacker chocolate brown, dark chocolate as opposed to that, uh, well, it's not really milk chocolate, but the less rufescent. If anything, the color gets darker as you come up to the bill. The bill color is a little more reddish and you can sort of see, see the same slant pattern down towards the bottom of the eye like in the adult. But the net effect is the whole supralaural area is dark and it sure pinches off that pale supercilium. And in the fall when you have many formative birds, uh, well here, um, if I go up in early September to Tioga Pass, uh, Saddleback Lake and there's still flocks of white crowns. They're kind of evenly mixed between orianthas that haven't left and gamble eyes that are migrating coming down. And it, it's just really easy to look at the face pattern and tell which one is which. Most of the orianthas are gone by about the 22nd of September from the Sierra Nevada. Here on the east side uh, in the Owens Valley, I see of course many more gamble eye, but I can usually see a few Oriantha during September. Interestingly, if I get one in August in the lowlands here on the east side of the Sierra, it's more apt to be Oriantha. Next slide. So that's the comparison. Your classic gamble eye on the right, the face pattern, look at the bill color, um, the way the supercilium is pinched off and the color of those lateral crown stripes. Next, Kimball, I think you'll be on. Yeah, um, I wanted to quickly back up to my initial discussion also of Nuttallai versus Pugetensis because I didn't really give the characters that separate those two. Um, in a way, that was sort of on purpose because there aren't really any good field characters that separate the two, but on average, Nuttallai is a heavier bird, a somewhat larger build bird, um, a bit shorter wings. So structurally, they're a little bit different. They're the largest and heaviest of all the white crown sparrow subspecies. Pugetensis, a bit uh, slightly longer winged, which makes sense. It's the migratory one of the two. Um, and a little bit longer tailed, um, a little bit smaller build. So a little closer, in other words, to typical gambolai in structure. So basically it's structural characters and the migratory versus non-migratory ha habits. So I just wanted to mention that since I kind of skipped that before. So the, I'm the sorry. formative Gimbal? or immature Gimbal? birds in this group are- I'm sorry, I don't mean yes. to interrupt, but um, also Mary Freeman asked, does pugetensis, yeah, I can't even speak, pugetensis show uh, kind of a yellowish wa wash under the wings? Yellow, yeah. Yeah, I saw that. I was, I was going to get to that because that's, um, I, don't, I don't think it's a great field character. You can often see this yellow right at what we call the bend of the wing. So um, I'm not sure if you can move the cursor there right along the kind of between the wing bars there right at the edge of the wing. But um, uh, they, there is definitely a yellowish tinge there. It's, it's a mark that banders use a lot because you catch a bird in a net and you can kind of hold the wing open and look underneath and see that yellowish in there. So, no, that's true. There is that yellowish wash in there. That's a good character. But overall, the bird is just kind of dingier, browner, and buffier. The back stripe pattern holds just as in the adults. Um, I find it maybe a little less um, obvious in the immatures, but I use the overall brownness. The bill is still yellow to pale yellow, um, often with a dark tip to it. And uh, the, as we mentioned, that little mustachial streak or whisker streak is present on most of the formative plumage birds in the Nuttallai pugetensis group or the Pacific Coastal group, whereas at most it's present only very subtly in the other subspecies. But I find it sometimes very striking in this Pacific Coast group. So the yellowish bill, the brownish wash to the underparts is much stronger than you would find in the other subspecies groups. Uh, the back patterning pretty much mirrors what we look at in the adults. Um, and again, we mentioned the mailer streaks are a good clue, but they're not diagnostic. Um, so just kind of a dingy, washed out, brownish um, group of birds. Next. And here we've got two together. So things again that might strike you looking at the gambolai versus the pugetensis. 
And it's a, it's a good thing to go study because certainly here in Southern California um, in the coastal areas, you can have a very good chance of seeing both of these in the same areas and compare them. So the dingier, buffier, browner Fugitensis on the left with a pale yellowish bill uh, versus the grayer, sort of cleaner looking gambolai with a still kind of an orangish tint to the bill there. Um, in this case, the Fugitensis shows a strong um, mustachial mark, which is absent in this particular gambolai and usually subtle in gambolai at best. Um, the yellow of the bend of the wing that we talked about a minute ago is is certainly a good mark, but it's just very hard to see in the field. Okay, next. So I'll jump in here. And just for clarity, the, the, this color at the bend of the wing, it's yellow in Nuttalai and Pugetensis, and it's grayish white in Leucophrys, Gambolai, and Oriantha. So it separates, if you see it, it separates it into one of two groups, at this time mixing Oriantha with the taiga group. So looking at this in reviewing of identification, of course we really emphasize the head pattern is by far the most important thing to scrutinize, but between the uh, taiga, the two taiga subspecies and Oriantha, and the Pacific group, you want to look carefully at the back pattern, that both the color of the centers and of the edges, whether they're uh, tannish color, like in Pugetensis and Nuttalai, or grayish white as in uh, Leucophrys, Gambolai, and Oriantha. The underparts are important, separating, again, the taiga and the western montane birds from the Pacific birds, again, much more buffy, colored on the, the um, Fugitensis nuttalii. And bill color is important, uh, particularly in separating the coastal birds, but also gambolai from uh, Leucophrys and Oriantha. And remember that adults are the most distinctive, but the formative immatures carry the, have the characters too. Next. So it's all repeated here. I think rather than repeat all of this, just keep in mind that will be available for reference, summarizing the, of all of these different things that, that we've stressed. Um, and it, it'll probably help when you can go back and look at photos or maybe the, if you have a copy of the 95 article uh, and, and reviewing the different things rather than just me regurgitate it here. Next. and the upper part pattern and the underparts. I do think most people say there's nothing you can do about Leucophrys and Orianta, but I think there are a couple things that are subtly different. And we'll talk about, uh, Kimball will talk about vocalizations, but the call note of Orianta is different from all the rest of them. Uh, merging Orianta and Leucophrys is a definite mistake in my opinion. Kimball. Yeah, so, um, you know, the white crown sparrow is often sort of referred to as the white rat of the bird world because it has been the subject of so many important studies and all sorts of aspects of biology and behavior and vocalizations and ecology and, and so on. It's a really well-studied bird with, with a few exceptions as we'll talk about, but certainly among the most famous of the studies are those of song variation in white crown. So we're not going to talk a lot about that. Uh, we're going to talk more about how vocalizations are useful for identification to the subspecies, the subspecies group. Uh, but we certainly wanted to give a nod to the, the really famous studies in particular, well, by many people, but in particular, we, we think of the uh, gentleman in the, in the next slide here. I think he's coming up next, is uh, Dr. Luis Baptista, uh, who of course is famous for his studies of white crown sparrow dialects, just local variations in um, songs and particularly in the San Francisco Bay Area, but he inspired a lot of other studies and also looking at the relationship between song 
and um, behavior, mating systems, uh, learning, uh, genetics, and so on. So he uh, did some phenomenal studies in the Bay Area and, and gave wonderful talks about the different dialects of the white crown sparrows in the Bay Area. But rather than go into this really interesting literature, we want to concentrate on using vocalizations for identification. So next slide. So basically, and this underscores a point John has been making, if you look at songs, we're going to talk mostly about songs here. Um, the taiga group, the songs are essentially identical. Um, so leucopres, the nominate birds, and gambolai sing their, their songs, although there's clearly variation. If you hear any of them, they all fit sort of within the same grouping. Uh, they're all easily recognizable as being within that group. In the Pacific Coastal group, the songs are quite different. Um, rather than sort of wheezy and buzzy and mournful with lots of buzzes and the distinctive patterns, uh, there's a lot of much sweeter notes and lively buzzy trills. Uh, it's just a very different song in quality. And Nuttalai and Pugetensis are essentially similar. But the kicker is that in Oriantha, which remember some had actually lumped in with Mamana and the Kofris, the songs, at least in the Sierra Nevada, are very similar to those of the Pacific Coastal group. Again, with these sweet notes and sweet trills and quite different from the, the sort of buzzy, mournful songs of the Taiga group. It gets a little more complicated because in the Rocky Mountains, the songs of Orientha are different and there may be some real biological differences between the Sierra Nevada and the Rocky Mountain and other interior Western mountain um, populations of Oriantha, and in fact, some of those songs are a little more like the Gambolai group, but um, by and large, uh, Oriantha fits in with the Pacific Coastal group in its songs. So we're going to play a few examples, and there's, again, some really good literature on all of this. So in the next slide, I think we might have some examples. So let's just play a typical, this is going to be Lecofries, again, from Eastern Canada, but I think if you're used to gambolai songs out here, it's going to ring a bell with you. So let's play the song of Lecofries. <laughs> So a lot of variation, but that's basically the, the same theme you'll hear in Gambolai, which is the next song that we'll play. This is Gambolai. Coming right up. So that should sound familiar to all of you. Uh, fortunately, these birds sing a lot during the winter, so it's not just on the breeding grounds. You've all heard them sing. Sometimes uh, they get really vocal in the wintertime. Now the call notes, uh, are very, of this group are very sharp sort of pink call. And there are other vocalizations as well, including nocturnal flight notes that are all great to learn, but we're just gonna concentrate on songs and uh, the subtle differences in the call notes are not gonna come across too well in these brief recordings, but basically the taiga group has the familiar gambolai like pink call note. Uh, Oriantha is, is somewhat noticeably different the Pacific Coast subspecies are very subtly different from Gambolai. Let's play a Gambolai call note here. So you're actually hearing a couple different notes there, a high sort of seat note and then the sharper pink note, as well as singing birds in the background. But the, again, these are birds, uh, the gam just familiar, familiarize yourself with gambolai, and you'll um, then be, I think, a little more appreciative of the differences between them and the, and the next groups that we'll talk about. So the next slide. Um, the, in the Pacific Coastal Group, and again, at least Sierra Nevada Orient, they're very similar, very, Lively, sweet, lots of sweet musical uh, sounds. The call note, which we'll play, um, the third thing we play is uh, 
often likened to a blue gross beak, a little heftier chink call than the pink to the gambolai. So let's play a song of nuttalai here, keeping in mind there's a lot of dialect variation. I think you'll appreciate that's quite different from the tiger group. The Oriantha is going to be much more like the Nuttalai song. Let's play an Oriantha song from the Sierra Nevada. Pretty fancy. White crowned sparrow. So again, un Tons of, thank you, that's what I thought. Tons of variation uh, among individuals and between populations, and between dialect groups, but the gist of the songs in these different groups are, are pretty much the same. Uh, the taiga group versus this group that includes both the Pacific Coast birds and Oriantha. And then just play a call note. This, it's gonna be hard to tell the difference, but this is the more blue gross beak like chink note of Oriantha. Um, again, just something to keep your ears open for. It doesn't come across real well in these brief recordings. But anyway, just some vocalization differences to think about and keeping in mind the variation. All right, next slide. So let me continue um, basically to say that there's not much to say. Uh, you would think that the white rat of the bird world would be probably have every subspecies, uh, have a complete genome of them. But uh, surprisingly, this has not been done or at least not been published. So we do know from some existing molecular studies that first of all, um, thank you, Lance. Yes, we should have. So um, we can go into... Well, well, we'll get back to that. There was a discussion and, and no, I'm just reading the chat and Lance Benner made a very good point that if you really want to talk about vocalizations, you use sonograms. And I can't recommend highly enough um, Nathan Peeplow's books on the bird songs of bird vocalizations of North American birds to look at those and to use Zeno Canto and, and um, Macaulay as well. Anyway, we know from genetic studies that Zonotrichia, which is the genus that includes the white crown sparrow, is the sister genus to Junko. So those two are the closest relatives within the Passerellids or New World sparrows. And those two together are uh, sister to Passerella, the fox sparrow, and Spizeloides, which is the um, American tree sparrow, which used to be considered a Spizella, but is actually closer to this group. We also know within Zonotrichia that white crown and gold crown sparrows are not only sister species within the genus, but genetically they're very, very similar to one another. Um, some of the published genetic work that's been done has really been looking on the fine scale, for example, within the Pacific Coastal Group, looking at Nuttallii versus Pugetensis. And um, somebody please correct me if I'm wrong, but we've looked and looked and there just at this point doesn't seem to be any range-wide molecular analysis of white crowned sparrow um, looking throughout their range of all subspecies. When those analyses are done, they don't usually divvy them up a priori into subspecies, but they sample from throughout the range and then look at how that variation matches or doesn't match subspecies variation. And so we're still awaiting publication of any such work there. So um, just to be determined. Next. So, John. Yeah, hi, Kimball. So, when we look at defining species, there's a number of things that are looked at. Uh, look in the tool shed, but three terms that are important um, is whether they're sympatric, allopatric, or parapatric. And the terms are defined there, but in an ideal situation, you look to see if, is there any area of sympatry where two taxa under consideration come together? And in the case of the white crowns, uh, the answer was uh, largely a no, but recently land use patterns, particularly cutting trees down, um, enabled uh, a, a zone of sympatry between P. 
Fugitensis and Gambolai, which then gets everybody very interested to see, well, what happens when they do? Uh, allopatric, the two populations are apart. They don't come together, and that requires more guesswork, which is so often uh, the case. And you look at genetics, and you look at vocalizations, and um, other those two, whether habitat usage differences. Parapatric, uh, they come right up to each other, but there's not a, a zone of overlap. Uh, so those are important terms, and um, we'll carry on. So I don't know if you can see it, but I highly recommend, does that show to the, the group, um, the Ornithologist Dictionary by Lynx, which Budio Book sells, a little pocket book, and it's a, a just a wonderful reference to check on definitions of ornithological terms. Uh, the penguins are not genetically similar to white crowns as far as I know, uh, but you don't know what the latest work is. Next uh, image. So with some back and forth, we came up with stipulation of facts. Now, Swarth, this is Harry S. Swarth, for which WFO named their most distinguished award for excellence in publications. Uh, Swarth was an amateur, uh, but he worked at uh, both at Berkeley and also at Cal Academy. Um, but in 1926, he published a paper where he split both the at the time, Leucafries, and from the Canadian Rockies, uh, Jasper, Banff is a separate species from Gambolai. I remember, but that's now the Leucafries and those Canadian Rockies equals Orientha. That was described in 1932. But he also split the Nuttali, Pugetensis wasn't recognized then. He split Nuttali from Gambolai. Um, and one of his reasons was he could find no intergrade specimens and cited other differences, including vocalizations, plus the plumage. Then um, Grinnell in 1928 decided that uh, Swarth was wrong and that the birds of the North Pacific, uh, the Puget Sound area were in fact a separate subspecies, Pugetensis, which he described in 1928. And to Grinnell's point of view, it was an intermediate subspecies with between Gambolai and Nuttali to the south. Banks came along in 1964 and said Grinnell was wrong, that Swarth was uh, right, that the uh, Pugetensis and Nuttali were very, very similar. And he also agreed he could find no intergrade specimens between Gambolai and Pugetensis, but thought, well, if they did get together, they probably would interbreed widely, and therefore they should be recognized only as subspecies. Um, so the Canadian Rocky Zone is the the birds up at the northern end, not surprisingly, in this area of study at Jasper, most of them look like uh, Gambolai. As you go south in the Canadian Rockies towards the U.S. border and glacier, they become increasingly like Orientha. Still, uh, in Swarth's time, he couldn't find hybrid specimens. There are now some to an unknown degree. Next slide. And this carries right into the priorities for further research. And the number one area, there's a superb paper by uh, Hunt and Baudet, widely, you can read it in Western Birds. I think it's uh, the 2014 volume number two with the yellow-billed magpie on it, studying these passes in the Cascades. And these pigeotensis have gotten because of the tree cutting have gotten up into these passes and even to the east side and have come into contact with Gambolai 
and appear to act as good species. Uh, that for me tips the balance to suggest a split, although additional uh, research would certainly be helpful of people actually spending long periods of time and studying to, you know, to see if there any of the birds show integrate characters. There was only one bird, as I recall from the study, that sang both songs, but otherwise they seemed to act as perfectly good species. And this was not just one pass, it was multiple locations. And also looking at the Canadian Rockies, what happens between Gambolai and Oriantha. So from my point of view, I would recommend a split of the two Pacific subspecies from the other three and then additional research to see what's going on with Oriantha. A Hun who's all into the song, he went up where the snowcocks are, the Ruby Mountains, heard Oriantha, and this is in his paper, and thought they sounded a lot like uh, Gambolai, unlike, very, unlike the Sierra and presumably the Cascades birds. You can see the various papers there about uh, vocalizations. And then of course, we really need uh, on a micro level genetic studies within the white crown complex to see what's going on, maybe particularly in the area of contact within the Cascades. Next slide. Here are the references. We haven't put in, uh, we put in Pat Piketty's reference on uh, white crowns and pugetensis within the Central Valley. But they're well known from the Walla Walla area too. And you can go to places like Parkfield, you know, right on the edge of the Central Valley. That's in Southeast Monterey County. And right in town there, most of the white crowns are pugetensis yet alone 20 miles away, I had a pugetensis in Fresno and was told, well, that would be a first record for Fresno County. So obviously nobody's really paying much attention, but of course, if they get split, then there'll be the, the panic. Well, how do you identify them? And it's like uh, God came down and made them distinctive and now we've got to learn them. And John, if I can interrupt one second, I just want to remind people that the Dun and Garrett um, article from 1995 is on our website at labirders.org and just click on webinars, then click on the White Crown Sparrow. Very good. I'd like to comment also, we'll probably write a motion up for the next uh, supplement of the AOS. Um, uh, Kimball, I would support the with the authors of the motion, I would support the split. Kimball would not. Uh, Lewis is, is on the fence. He initially said, yeah, he probably would favor it. And, but then Curtis Morantz, the gossiper of extraordinaire, has said, no, Lewis has changed his mind. So I, I don't know that. In any case, that's okay within the authors of a motion of different opinions, even if they don't support a split. It gets the facts out there and what's still needed. It takes, the AOS has 12 members that would require a vote of eight, two thirds for a split, act, for any change of the status quo. We thank Sylvia for all of the vocalizations and all of the photographers who provided information. I hope we have Jonathan Aldifer as a co-author. Jonathan uh, did our color plate for the 95 article and was closely involved in that article. It may seem a little rusty now. It was 25 years ago. We can barely remember it, but nevertheless, <laughs> it's there. Yeah, we did have a couple of questions that came up, John, if you don't mind, and Kimball. Um, from, <laughs> from Laura, um, she asks, are white crowns okay with interacting with other birds? I saw a gambolai last winter with a group of house finches moving from my feeder and tree and tree to tree. Kimball, you want to handle that? Yeah, um, that's Laura's question. And 
Well, of course, they're all coming to seed feeders. So a lot of different kinds of birds come to feeders. And that means they're going to interact because the food's there and all these birds are coming in. So white crowns are flocking birds in the wintertime. Um, I'm going to get my video off here so maybe you can hear me better. But white crowns are flocking birds. They're usually in sort of, well, they, they will certainly get into mixed species flocks, although it's not at all uncommon to see pure flocks of dozens, if not even hundreds sometimes of gambles, uh, white crowns in the winter. But um, they'll, yeah, I, I, no kind of interaction like the one you described at your feeders would surprise me when birds are attracted to seed. So um, just keep watching and maybe you'll figure out what they're doing. All right. Um, then I noticed Walt has a question about bill color. Now, you know, everybody's perception of orange versus yellow versus candy corn versus all that is, um, you know, a bit subjective. Um, Walt, of course, has his uh, well-known banding station in Zuma Canyon, where he certainly gets both Pugetensis and Gambolai in the wintertime there. And, of course, no white crowns at all in the summertime. Mm -hmm. But... Um, the, I agree with him that the where we talk about an orange bill in the article, the plate somehow got a little washed out and it doesn't look quite as orangish as it should. And even in one or two of the photos, we show that orange doesn't come through that well. But in general, I think the, the distinctions we talked about are pretty valid. The Pacific Coast group having a yellowish bill and the, the Taiga group having orange too in the case of nominate um, Luca Fries having almost a pinkish red bill. So, but a lot of that's, you know, your own perception, I think. I don't know, John, do you want to, shall I just keep going through these questions? I don't know, John, if you're looking at the questions or not. Yeah, uh, that'd be great if you and John could. So I'm down, what question are we down now to? Uh, oh, Pat, well, there's Pat, a question about the fog line. We talked about we talked about nuttalai, the breeding range being pretty much restricted to the fog belt, and um, obviously there's um, you know once you get mountains inland from the coast, that's going to stop a lot of the fog from going farther inland. So in general, nuttalai pretty much stops as a breeder inland of the first range of mountains, but there's going to be some exceptions. But you know the point is they don't go way into the interior parts of the coastal counties of within their range. And then Tom Benson has, I'll let John take that one. Yeah, let me first just make a comment that we didn't talk about Pugetensis migration in relation to Gambolai, but it's both, uh, as I recall earlier, this is work from the Farallons where they get a number of both, that Pugetensis is earlier in the fall and earlier in the spring. So if you have a singing bird and say May, that's a Pugetensis or a Nuttalai, it probably is a Nuttalai because the Pugetensis should all be out there, out of there. Uh, and Cape Mendocino separates, uh, in southern uh, Humboldt there, separates Pugetensis from Nuttalai. It hardly seems a very, like a major barrier to me. Uh, and I don't know what happens right at Cape Mendocino. Um, yeah, it's Tom Benson. Nasca booby, more like a mass booby. Uh, yeah, right, Tom. You want to raise my <laughs> blood pressure at the meeting. Um, there was another question in there about, uh, yeah, the, up in the, the Orientha does breed in the Southern California mountains, in the San Bernardinos, um, up on, I don't know exactly where, but on Mount San Gorgonio at a high elevation. They're certainly easy to find in the Sierra on the passes that you go over, Tioga Pass is, a, you know, if you can get in there, is an easy one. But Carson Pass, they're in the willow thickets uh, at fairly high elevation and locally a little lower around meadows like at Kirkwood. You'll hear them singing. This year, I had singing away a couple of males. And then uh, about May 5th, there were six inches of snow. And I went up there afterwards. And there were no Oranthas. I don't know whether they died or decided the hell with this and uh, either went back to Mexico or down the hill and waited for better conditions. Let's see, Zuma Beach, we see. Gamble's White Crowns. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. 45% yeah. Interesting data from Walt's 
Walt's banding of, you know, you get a little bit inland in Zuma Canyon up at the end of the road where the banding station is. And Walt's saying they're 95% gambles and 5% uh, pugetensis. Whereas right downstream, as you get to Zuma Beach, it becomes a much more even mix. So even in, in winter, we know that pugetensis is much more coastal, gambleized pretty much everywhere. But in this case, even on that kind of micro scale, uh, Walt can see the differences there. And I found at Kimball at Goleta, you walk along the, there's, where there's lots of both, you'd find little micro groups that'd be all gambolite or seemingly on the basis of song. And then you'd find a, a area made a little more mesic, denser brush, and suddenly they'd all be pugetensis. So they separate out even where there's sympatric slightly by habitat. And people have noticed that too. Um, uh, let's see, Luke. Uh, Luke DeSico, he's studying where red fox sparrows and sooty fox sparrows come together at the north of Cook Inlet and finds micro habitat differences where they overlap uh, as well as behavioral differences. Mm -hmm. Let me also just uh, mention that I see in the chat that uh, Lance is, is pointing out that there are relatively few recordings, for example, of Oriantha from the Sierra Nevada in Zeno Canto. He also mentions as one labeled as nominant Lacofries from uh, near Sierraville, um, which is clearly going to be misidentified or, or just a taxonomic confusion. But um, in fact, of course, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of recordings of white crowns from the Sierras that have been used in various studies and publications and things. They just happen not to be in Xenocanto. So um, for those of us who use Xenocanto to refer to looking at differences geographically and between species and so on, um, we really like it when people can get out there and record more and upload more, um, more recordings. I would point out that, and this goes back to um, discussion of Baptista and others, um, that the, they actually recorded San Bernardino Mountain Orientha white crowns, uh, San Gorgonio, and they, of course they breed around Bluff Lake as well, or at least they used to. And those birds were indistinguishable from Sierra Nevada birds in song. Um, the idea being of that clearly colonized south from the Sierra Nevada. And all this discussion of song, you have to keep in mind that these songs are learned. They're learned during a kind of an early sensitive period and they can mislearn songs. So um, if you say, well, I went somewhere and it's the range of so-and-so, the song was like such and such, that shouldn't be there. It could well just be a bird that learned the wrong song. Maybe it didn't solidify its song learning till it mixed with other populations on the, in fall or something. So uh, it's really complicated, this song stuff. So Kimball, here's uh, from Justina. You want to talk about sister species. We're talking about the two most closely related species can be referred to as sister species. Kimball, you want to expand on that? Well, no, I mean, just basically think of evolution as a branching pattern. And when you have a branch and you, you go off in two directions, those are the sisters. And so uh, at some point there was a common ancestor of Zonotrichia and Junko, then a branch occurred. So those are sister genera. And then of course, within each branch, there was a, uh, additional um, speciation and so on. And then within Zona Trichia, we know that genetically golden crown and white crown are the closest, are closest to each other. Uh, so we refer to them as sister species. Here's a question I see, Kimball, about when was the second set of type specimens taken? And I would have to look at Banks' 1964 monograph because I believe he does discuss that about the whole issue of what to do about the what is you know what to do about nigger laura and he gives the entire history and the second set which was am which was ambiguous um i i, I do know that forester's birds were lost and their uh, phillips digging into the hudson bay birds just felt on a whole they were more typical with gambolai than they were to the birds farther east in Quebec. Yeah, pugetensis, huh? a yellow, yellow wash on the wings like Nautilus does. Easy in the hand, hard to see in the field. 
Remember Grayish White and um, Gambali and um, Luca Fries and Orientha. All right. Are there any other questions or comments that anyone has? One question, I have a comment to make. It was the question about the white crowns are, you know, mixing with house finches. And, you know, sometimes you get a, a stray sparrow and it'll join uh, with whatever's there. Um, the probably a single bird wandering around like that Ross's gull, uh, you get more vulnerable to predators. So they're going to join a flock. Um, when people ask us, what's the best way to learn sparrows? I always say, learn the genus it's in. Of course, we haven't helped the situation with splitting genera. And I'm on a campaign to put five-striped sparrow in its own genus and get it out of the black-throated genus. But um, learn, learn, learn the behavior and how they act. Well, that's, those are synonyms. Um, the spazellas are all pretty distinctive in their own way. Long tails, little bills, obviously juncos, the crown sparrows. They're the secret of sparrows that are just very difficult to see, especially when not singing. And on we go. Sparrows are a lot of fun, uh, but they sort of, little brown jobs, They people feel threatened by them. And uh, yeah, they can be challenging to say the least. Well, uh, I think we might have a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, Kimball and John, if you want to take a look at the questions, I think two more came in. Yeah, so Mary is asking about the Hudson Bay specimens that appear to be intergrades, and we use the term intergrade within subspecies rather than hybrids, which we tend to restrict to between recognized species. So how can you have a type specimen that's an integrate? Well, a type specimen is a type specimen. So um, as John mentioned, uh, you, that could have maybe sunk the proper use of the lacophrys as applying to the Eastern Canadian birds. But in the interest of stability, it was decided not to make that radical change that Alan Phillips had suggested. So. Um, he followed Todd uh, in that in that recommendation. Um, I mean, I just don't have the time. I could uh, next time I see or talk to Tom, I'll I'll dig that out. Uh, the history of the the story on the the Hudson Bay birds. I do know they went up and got a second series at Churchill, which is also on Hudson Bay. I'd always thought, well, that's Lucifrice, and started to point out the characters of Lucifrice, and then I got confused very quickly and said, well, we're really here to look at other birds, not at white crowned sparrows. Tour leaders can always form their own dodges. I'm just kidding, of course, but <laughs> the, Hudson, the Hudson Bay birds are a mess. All right. Well, well, thank. Uh, and I don't see anything else. And with that, I just want to thank John Dunn and Kimball Garrett for presenting for us tonight. It, it was really, really wonderful. Um, there were we've had we were at a high sometimes of over 60, 65 uh, people getting something out of these uh, webinars. So I really appreciate it. Also, I just want to remind everyone um, that on our website at labirders.org, uh, we under webinars under White Crown Sparrow, we will have. Um, the 1995 article that was written by uh, John and Kimball. We also have the notes for this lecture, for this webinar, and we'll have a link to the uh, program so that you all can go and take a look at the program, take a look at some of those slides and check out bill coloring again and all that. And uh, John and Kimball, any last words? Yeah, oh, I'm, hold uh, I'm holding up the bank's monograph, if you can get a hold of it. It's very well done. Um, and uh, 
I think it was Dick Banks' PhD dissertation. He went on to chair the North American Checklist Committee for many years, was on the committee for many years. And as I was working on this article, I started peppering him with all these questions on white crowns. And he said, John, it's been a long, long time since I thought about white crowns. So, but Tom's answer is in here about uh, the whole issue of the Hudson Bay birds. That's my last comment. It's always the written word and you've got to follow the historical, you know, who published what, when. Uh, I'm very impressed with Harry Swarth, an amateur who had always, he thought about these issues in depth. And uh, it was his expedition that got the only two bumblebee hummingbirds to the United States, even though he didn't see them or collect them. All right. Well, uh, thank you both very, very much. And on behalf of all the LABirders.org people out there, Mark Shield, Frank and Susan Gilliland, Katie uh, and Eileen, and I don't think I missed anyone. Uh, oh, and Janet Shield, of course. And uh, we thank you very much. Again, if you want to join, help us out, uh, help us expand, please, please contact us. You can contact us through the website or you can contact me directly. And Mark, do you have anything that I missed? And Mark nope, is... I don't have anything. Um, just thank you very much to uh, John and Kimball uh, for such a fantastic presentation. Yes, it was great. So thanks and for setting it up. Well, thank, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, we are looking to make the second Tuesday of every month our webinar night. So uh, please try and keep that available uh, and we'll be expanding on everything we're doing as right now we're just trying to get the organization up and running. And with that, I think we're done. Unless uh, John or Kimball, do you have any questions for us? We're done too. We're done too. It's yeah. been a long night. Well, again, thank you all very, very much. And we'll see you next month. All right. Yeah. Thank you.